Hi, Jay. Hi, it's Tina, and I'm here with uh, this week's message for you. First off, I just want you to know that all of us who volunteer at Jay High are really thinking about you and hoping that you are all doing well, even though life has taken a kind of unusual turn for all of us. We, uh, we love you and we are hoping that everyone is healthy and safe and that you are finding ways to entertain yourself and that among those ways you are finding time to spend with God. That you are reading your Bibles or uh, maybe doing some worship music and that you are uh, finding extra time to pray. And, and we are praying for you and your safety and your well-being. So uh, this week we're going to continue on in the message of blank it. And this week we're going to be talking about believe it. So the text that I'm going to use to talk to you about this is, comes from uh, the Gospel of Luke. And I want you to think about something first. I want you to just kind of think about what is it that you believe about yourself? Um, you might think that you're a good athlete. Uh, you might think that you're a good student. You might think that you're a good older brother or sister, or you might think that you're an important part of your family because you cheer people up. You might think that you're a good friend. You might, uh, but on the other side, there are sometimes thoughts that we have that are not quite so positive. You might think, oh, you know what? I'm really not a very good athlete. I'll never make the team. Or, oh man, I can't carry a tune at all. I'm never going to be able to worship God the way I really want to in my heart. Or you might think, oh, you know, I cheated on a test. I guess I'm a cheater. Or, oh, I clicked on a website where I shouldn't have gone. Um, what does that make me? And so what I want you to believe is that you are a child of God. And that once you have given your heart to Jesus, nothing, nothing can take that away from you. You will always be God's child. And we see a really good example of this in Luke chapter 15. Verses 11 through 32, uh, this scripture is often called the prodigal or the lost son. So I'm not going to read the whole scripture to you because that would take up most of my time and I don't want to do that. Um, but I, And I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with it. The younger son in a family goes to his dad and he basically says to him, you know, I really would like my money now. I can't wait for you to die. I really want to go out and have a great time and I can't do that without money so I'm the younger son, and I know I'm not going to get the whole estate, but uh, can you give me what's coming to me, and I'm going to go out into the world and, and just have a blast. And so the father, I can only imagine how he felt, but he did as his son wished. He gave him his half of the inheritance, and off the son goes. And he goes uh, far away, and he engages in all sorts of bad things. So he's partying, he's being with women, he's... He's doing substances he shouldn't be doing. He's doing all those kinds of things that we really would encourage you not to be doing in your life. But he's doing them, and he's having a great time, and he has tons of friends until his money runs out, which tells you what kind of friends they really were. So once the money runs out, all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, yeah, we're not hanging out with you anymore, and off they go. And now he's in this far-off land without any money, so he needs a job because he has to eat. And he gets a job feeding pigs, which was not a really glamorous job, right? And he is so hungry at a certain point that he looks down at the food that he's feeding the pigs and he thinks, you know what, I wish I could eat that. And then God moves in his heart, because God will do this for us. And at that moment, he kind of, he figures out that even if he goes back, right, he goes back to his father's estate, if he were a servant at his father's estate, he would have more to eat and, have, and be more comfortable than he was being independent off in this far off land. So he gets it in his head that he's going to go back and he's going to beg his father for forgiveness and say, look, I, I screwed up. I was really bad. I'm really sorry. Can you just let me be a servant here on the estate? That's all I'm asking for. I just want to be a servant. So he makes up his mind and he starts the long journey. Remember, no airplanes. They had to walk. So he's walking or riding, and in the distance, when he's getting close enough to be within visual distance, the father sees him coming up the road, right? And which kind of makes you think the father has been looking for him a lot, not just that one day. And when, uh, and the father starts running towards him, he doesn't even wait for the son to come to him, he runs down the road to greet him, and he gives him a big hug and a kiss, and then the son says to him in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. There, the story goes on. There's a lot about the older brother, but that would be a whole other message. What I want you to do is I want you to notice this. Two things. The father didn't even respond to what the son said. Right? The fa he didn't even say anything about being a servant. The father just loved on the son with clothes, great food, and a party. This is how God, your father, responds to you when you come to him. And I know you're thinking, but, but you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't know what you've done. Okay, I don't know which website you clicked on. I don't know what substance you tried just because you were curious. I don't know the things that you have done. I don't know that you yelled at your little sister because she's getting on your nerves after two weeks or three weeks at home. I don't know that you talked back to your parents or cursed them out. I don't know those things. I don't have to know those things. I don't care about those things. God knows those things. It doesn't matter. He tosses them out. Because all he wants is for you to come to him with, his, with your heart open. So when you come and you give this whole big long list of stuff to your father, this is how God your father responds to you, like the father and the prodigal son did, right? He'll listen to the statement, but he doesn't dwell on it. He dwells on the fact that you're asking for forgiveness and that you're trusting in him. He is so happy that you are coming to him back where you belong in his loving arms. That is how God deals with you. So I just want you to remember that, and I want you to believe it. I want you to believe that you are a child of God, and that he will welcome you just the same way that he welcomed the prodigal son. That's why Jesus told us this parable. He told us so we would begin to understand, because it's so hard for us to understand, that God can look the other way. He can say, you know what? I know you've done those things. Those sins were paid for. Jesus paid for those sins. They were paid for at the cross. And because you're coming back to me and you've confessed your sins and you are my child, I love you. I will always love you. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. I hope this encourages you and I hope it helps you to understand just how much God loves you. And I need you. It is so important. We all need you to believe it.